Welcome to the new Cybersecurity Risk Management course. Data these days is one of the most valuable assets, which is why data security became one of the most important tasks for every organization. This is because security failures can put any company into risk. NIST Risk Management and Cybersecurity Framework will help you understand, manage and reduce the cybersecurity risks in your organization. So one of the most recent changes that was added this year was a supply chain function. So unlike the rest of the courses, this course will cover the five essential aspects of supply chain risk management in the most recently updated version of the NIST cybersecurity framework. So we will start this course by discovering all steps and tools to improve the network infrastructure protection of any organization through improved asset controls, awareness and training, their security protection policies and more. And then we'll explore in detail the core NIST cybersecurity framework concepts such as identify, protect, detect, respond and recover. NIST framework core. Hi everyone and welcome back to the course. In this video, we're going to talk not only about the NIST framework work core, but I'm going to introduce you to all the elements of a NIST framework. So, as you already know, NIST bases its entire framework on the concept of risk management, which is the ongoing process of identifying, assessing and responding to risk. So, under the risk management approach, the organization may choose to handle risk in different ways, including mitigating the risk, transferring the risk, avoiding the risk, risk or accepting the risk. All of those would have potential impact on the organization. So, as I said, the framework consists of three main parts. The framework core, the framework implementation and the framework profile ties. The purpose of those three parts is to provide a common language that all organizations can use, understand manage and communicate their cybersecurity initiatives both internally and externally and that can scale down up to various parts of the organization so let's talk about the nist core so the nist core is a set of activities aimed at organization cybersecurity initiatives to achieve specific outcome the core has five functions identify protect detect respond and recover which with each of those functions there are specified categories of activities and for each subcategory there are informative references usually standards for helping support the activities you can see the subcategories here in front of you so we have the identity id protect id detect respond and recover and from all of those as i said you have subcategories that you can see in front of you and those subcategories could have a unique identifier and they assigned each of those five fundamental functions and here's how it works. For example, one category under the function identify is asset management. A subcategory of asset management is physical devices and systems within the organizations. For that subcategory, the framework offers informative references that guide the physical devices that are used. Those standards might include, for example, how to manage your inventory. Although some organizations find the framework core categories and subcategories to be a bit uh, daunting, NIST intends them to be resources from which certain elements can be selected and examined, or you can use them depending on the organization's unique configuration. NIST does not intend to make this structure serving as a checklist of required activities. So this is how the NIST score looks like. and. That was everything for today, guys. In the next video, we're going to talk about the framework implementation ties. Thanks for watching. Framework implementation and profile. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to that section. Today, we're going to talk for the NIST framework implementation ties, and then we're going to talk about the framework profiles. So the framework implementation ties consist of four levels, depending on how the organization looks at cybersecurity risk, or basically how it manages the risk. Although the levels are progressive in terms of uh, sophistication, the tier 1 is partial while the tier 4 is called adaptive. They are not maturity levels in terms of uh, cybersecurity approaches. NIST based successful implementation of the outcomes described in the organization target profiles rather than progression from let's say tier 1 to tier 4. So here is how those uh, tires look like. So if we start with tire one, this is called partial. 
and here risk is managed in an ad hoc and sometimes reactive manner. There is limited awareness of cybersecurity risk at the organization level with known actually no organization-wide approach for cybersecurity. So this means the organization may not have the processes in place to participate in coordination or collaboration for dealing with the cybersecurity risk. Then tier two is called risk informed. And in that tier, the management approves the risk management practices, but in that case, they may not be an organization-wide policy. There is awareness of the cybersecurity risk at the organization level, but still an organization-wide approach has not been established. And in that case, the organization understands the broader ecosystem of risk, but it has not formalized any practices to deal with it. Then tier three is called repeatable, and this applies to organization's risk management practices that are approved and formally adopted as a policy. There is an organization-wide approach to risk management and the organization collaborates and receives information from parties about risk in quite wide ecosystem. And the final, the final tier is called adaptive. And this is for organizations that adapt to their own cybersecurity practices from lessons that they learned in the past. Cybersecurity risk management uses risk-informed policies, procedures, and processes. And it is a large part of the organizational culture and the organizations actively share information with their partners. So once you know the framework implementation tires, let's talk about the framework profile. And to a framework profile, we can refer a blueprint or a map that consides the framework functions, categories and subcategories for a specific person, sorry, uh, for a specific purpose, depending of course on the organization needs. So organizations should develop profiles for current or desired cybersecurity objectives and some organizations can create multiple profiles for different segments or aspects of the organization. So this doesn't create a specific profile or specific template for the profile appearance because the framework users should create their own profiles depending on their organization specific needs. As this points out, there is no right or wrong way to develop a profile. So as you can see on the figure in front of you, the factors that could go into a profile are the organization business objectives, threat environment, requirements and controls, all of which create the cybersecurity profile unique to your organization. The profiles should imply where the organization wishes to be or its target. As NIST starts in the framework document, the risk-based approach enables an organization to gouge resource estimates to achieve cybersecurity goals in cost-effective and prioritized manner. So that was everything for today, guys. I hope this video was useful for you to learn the framework profiles and the framework implementation tires. Thanks for watching. And in the next video, we're going to talk about the recent NIST framework developments. And we're going to talk about specifically in which areas NIST is the most useful today. Thanks for watching. I'm uploading completely free programming courses every week, so make sure you hit the subscribe button to get more coding skills. What is cybersecurity risk? Hi everyone, today we're going to talk about what is a cybersecurity risk and how you can manage it. One of the critical foundations of the secure organization is to develop solid practice of cybersecurity risk management. So cybersecurity risk management is basically looking at what could get wrong and then come up with ideas to put those problems to minimum. It is basically what most of us try to do daily to ensure that the things get smoothly whenever organizing our time, managing finances or watching over our children. In the same way, cybersecurity risk management is coming up with ways to make sure things go as smoothly as possible with our mission specific assets. As this is true, for our everyday lives, managing cybersecurity risks is an ongoing, multidimensional process. One significant distinction exists 
with a cybersecurity that doesn't always apply in our daily lives. Within an organization, everybody needs to be involved in managing the cybersecurity risk from the very top level of the decision makers down to the employees responsible for putting into place the cybersecurity risk practices and politics. So in the same way as it goes in our lives, the risk management in cybersecurity can be compli complicated and tiring. And there could be endless topics to explore there. But what I would cover in this section is basically the fundamentals, the fundamental practices and activities that should hold you in a good stand as your organization goes to the road to perform effective cybersecurity. So let's talk about the risk management process. So before going into the actual risk planning and the management practices, Let's do a little bit of a background. In addition to the cybersecurity framework we already discussed, the National Institute of Standards and Technology NIST has also developed a cybersecurity risk management framework that characterizes the concept as a sophisticated process that requires every organization to perform some, to perform some tasks. So the first task is to frame the risk or determine how much risk your organization is willing to take on giving constraints on the upper management goals. Then is the assess risk, where we determine the importance of the various assets we should know which are protected and the degree in which the assets are vulnerable. Then we should be able to define the response to the risk or come up with plans and actions if the risk gets out of control. And finally, we should be able to monitor risks on a daily basis. We should be able to check the risk plans and ensure that we have implemented them and updated them as the situations in our organization change. We should also be able to have our plans clear so we can monitor them in certain period of time. So even though the cybersecurity risk management should be part of everybody's job in the organization, it is critical to establish clear roles of responsibility with your organization, more specifically of who will be held accountable for the risk that you face and who will own that risk or be responsible if something goes wrong. And normally, this job typically, typically face the organization's chief information security officer or the comparable IT executive. It is actually a very good practice, and this is really recommended, that the owners of the risk are also the ones that will be covering the costs if that risk materializes. Of course, for some organizations, that business model might, might not fit, depending on the structure of your organization, but the point is to establish clearly the risk responsibility and the roles through the organization. If you think about it, if your organization doesn't do that, some or even many risks may fall into the cracks of diffused responsibility. And you may never address this risk adequately until it's too late. So I hope you learned a lot guys from this video and I really advise you to take notes because those are really important things that could help to every organization to deal quite good with risk. And in the next video, we're going to talk about the asset management. Thanks for watching. Asset management. Hi, everyone. Have you ever heard the term security hygiene? Well, if you haven't, this is one of the most critical cybersecurity elements. On a day-to-day -day basis, the IT assets must be appropriately managed and kept in as a secure manner as possible. So some of the tasks in this practice of a good cybersecurity hygiene are the following. Always patch the software as soon as vendor security updates are issued. You should always protect all systems in your organizations or all systems that face risk with up-to-date antivirus protection. And finally, you should secure all assets using the assets controls. So you should use things such as authentication and authorization. Authentication basically means algorithms for creating stronger passwords, multi-factor and critical system external authentication, while authorization covers mainly the role-based access control and privileges. So what this means is that not everybody in your organization should have access to absolutely every information in your organization. So you should keep the information as much as the particular employee needs it. So uh, fundamentally at the core of the cybersecurity risk assessment is knowing what assets you have, keeping track on them, and making sure you know which assets employees, vendors, and others have permission to use. In the NIST framework, most functions that qualify as asset management fall under the core function of identity. So one very key phrase in the NIST cybersecurity framework is if you don't know what you have, you don't know what you need to protect. You also don't know how to protect it or 
how to change your management to protect it, and so on. So you find many improvements by simply knowing and managing what you have. Most businesses don't want to spend time and money or effort to manage their assets in that way. So the key challenge here is to understand what assets are critical. So if you're part of the board of the executives, it is basically your job to take as much risk as you can. Your job is not to take as little risk as you can because this is not good for the business. In fact, it is exactly the opposite. So you're looking at the leadership of the organization. Normally, leadership is driving as fast and as hard as they can in order to achieve their goals. So the risk management side is looking from exactly the opposite perspective. This framework defines the outcome of asset management as the data, devices, employees, systems, facilities, and so on, to enable the organization to achieve their business purposes, identified and management of those properties with relative importance to the business objectives. And this all needs to be done while keeping in mind the organization business strategy. And this is very important to understand and be adopted by every company. So, in fact, there are a set of practices that are building the asset management and are designed to manage the life cycle and the inventory of technology assets, which provides a great value to the organization. And those are lowering the IT and the OT costs, while at the same time reducing the IT and the OT risk, improving productivity, and you can do that through proper and predefined asset management, then maximizing the values of the organization assets, and finally increasing the knowledge of the employees that need those kind of assets within your organization. So we're reviewing the same critical assets that you should know to keep your organization as secure and reliable as possible. One of those key practices is keeping inventory. So in the next video, guys, I'm going to talk about what is the idea of keeping inventory in your company, what are the type of inventories that you should keep, and how to ensure that this inventory is up to date. That said, thank you very much for watching this video, and I will see you in the next one. Keeping hardware inventory updated. Hi guys, today we're going to talk about one type of inventory that you should keep within your company as part of the NIST framework guidelines, and this is the hardware inventory. And this requirement closely aligns with the critical subcategory in the NIST framework, which is called ID AM1 called physical devices and systems within the organization are inventory. I recommend you to learn more about this uh, subcategory and we're actually going to do that in this video and we're going to continue doing that in the next ones in detail. So one of the most important and actually least practices practiced cybersecurity tasks conducted worldwide is to conduct inventories and keep them updated. Because basically you cannot defend what you don't know that exists in your inventory. This critical risk should extend to your headquarters and remote locations. No matter if you have a local shop or a huge corporation. You can actually create an up-to-date inventory of all assets that store or process information on a simple spreadsheet. And you can use, for that reason, a configuration database which is recommended for large organizations. The critical requirement is that the inventory should be maintained at all times. Many organizations really fail this critical security activity because they really don't know where to start. One of the good practices for keeping inventory is to separate this inventory based on different locations or devices. For example, in the figure in front of you, you can see different offices in which there are different type of objects, so you can keep inventory for each of those offices and then finally put the totals into the bottom right corner. So that is pretty simple and it really applies not only for the physical devices but also for the software devices and services. This is especially a good practice if you have employees that are working from home because this is a single source of truth when devices are allocated to your employees. You should always make sure the devices are immediately shipped back short, shortly after an employee leaves the company. So the other question is, if you're a middle-sized organization, where should you keep your inventory? Of course, if it's a short list for a small company, you can either use Excel or you can also use Google Sheets. Updates to the inventory can come from various internal sources. They can come from IT requests and purchases. When, for example, we purchase new equipment based on the request of an employee, those could be laptops or services. You can simply send emails to the responsible people when you update the spreadsheet and you can share this spreadsheet between multiple people so it gets updated constantly and also you can see who updated it. Of course, for more mature operations, you can create automated system 
and create configuration management database. You should always make sure that you include in the relevant records the necessary data to identify the network ad address, hardware address, machine name, data asset owner, and it is a good practice to also put inside the department and also a person to approve the change of status of the current set. Where possible, you should always tie the software inventory to the hardware asset inventory, so you can track all devices and the associated software with them. You can also include in your inventory cloud components such as software service, platform service, infrastructure service, and so on. Adding and updating inventory should also include removing unauthorized assets from the network. So this process could include physically removing systems via software methods and redirect their ability to communicate over internet. So to inventory every physical device and system, you should be actively managing all hardware devices. So in that case, you can make sure that you are giving only the authorized devices the assess for different uh, purposes and software use. You should always be able to find un unauthorized or unmanaged devices and prevent them to get access to your network. This is because those devices could do damage and they present a potential risk to your systems. So this inventory should include at minimum all devices that have IP addresses, but you should also include all sets that has potential to store and process information, including assets that do not connect to network, because all of those devices could be a potential entry points for an attacker. So any weak link to IT can really link to further system vulnerabilities and even to be responsible for complete system compromise and a device is being taken over by the hackers. So there are three categories I want to talk about related to creating inventory. The first one are the traditional IT inventory, which includes things like uh, desktops, laptops, mobile devices, um, things such as uh, servers, USB devices, backup systems, voiceover, IP telephone systems, storage area networks, and many more. Now, you know, in the recent years, we're actually talking quite often about Internet of Things and you should also keep a separate inventory for Internet of Things devices. And those devices really need to be protected because uh, even if you protect your IT devices, they can still be controlled by the Internet of Things devices. So the voice activated digital assistants such as Siri, uh, Google and Alexa should be all protected as they can assess your other devices. You should also protect Internet connected industrial building systems such as HVAC system, lighting systems, and so on. In the Internet of Things, it's a good idea to include internet-connected applications such as Wi-Fi connected kitchen machines, including uh, coffee makers, refrigerators, if you want ovens, and so on. So for that reason, all organizations need to pay attention to traditional and emerging IT hardware assets and have extensive list of Internet of Things devices, devices and specialized equipment that your organization is using. So even though all the digital equipment is basically designed for connectivity to internet, all the new gears, or let's say most of them, are actually coming with IP address for their internet connectivity so they can be easily tracked. Your organization may have greater or fewer types of equipment to include in your inventory. And it's a good idea to have, for example, a DHCP server, which is dynamic, host configuration protocol and so those DHCP servers basically assign IP address to your devices so you can easily track them. So it's a good idea to have a DHCP server and then this would assign to each of your devices a separate IP address which you can use to assess them and to update their hardwares into the inventory easily. So once you conduct the inventory, your job is not done. The inventory should always be updated as frequently as possible or as frequently as their changes to your inventory. You can also add a network monitoring system that could notify the administrators of the presence of unauthorized devices in the network. Those systems are really helpful because they can do uh, network monitoring 24 seven, or you can set them uh, to monitor your network on periodic intervals if you don't want this to be done all the time. There are even so many monitoring systems that are completely free. Uh, also, some of those are paid, but this shouldn't be that costly for any organization to have and it is completely worth it. Once you have such system in place, you should always do a regular testing of that system and see if it uh, caches all the new hardware. So one very good method to identify unauthorized assets is to ensure that the hardware asset inventory records are showing network addresses, hardware addresses, 
machine name, data set owner, and department for managing that device. So this is how you can manage your uh, hardware within your company and to really ensure that there are no unauthorized devices within your network and have a clear list of the devices that are currently having access to your network. So that's really important and really if you have a business that owns multiple devices allocated to different employees, please make sure that you have inventory because this is one of the key recommendations of the new cybersecurity framework. That's it guys, thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next video. Keeping software platform inventory. Hi everyone, in the real world you don't only need to keep hardware inventory but also you need to be keeping software inventory as well. The NIST framework subcategory that covers the aspect of cyber risk management is known as ITM2 called software platforms and applications within the organization should be inventoried. So in the same way as we have the concept for inventory every physical device in the organization, it is the same important to inventory software as well and this will really help you to actively track all software in the network so only the authorized users can use unauthorized software. This also helps to find unauthorized or unmanaged softwares on the devices and make sure that it can either not be installed or be uninstalled automatically. Most organizations find that creating inventory for software is more complicated than doing so for hardware. There is a very wide variety of softwares used and trusted. Also, many employees quite often don't want different software. Still, you should always track all the software on the different IT hardware devices, such as laptops, desktops and servers, phones and mobile devices. So to create the software inventory, we need to create a comprehensive list of softwares used in each chain of operations. You should make sure that your organization, of course depending on the size, have some software tracking tool and you can really automate it. This would really help to pinpoint the installation and activation of unauthorized and potentially unsafe software in your laptops or basically the laptops of your employees. It can really help you to track the software patches that most of the software supplies issue in ongoing basis. You can also help in that way by having automated tool to the administrators to implement white list of softwares and also create on their side a blacklist with software that shouldn't be installed or websites that shouldn't be visited. Just as the case of the hardware inventories you should update software inventories regularly. A good scenario would be to implement a combination of endpoint management and control by whitelisting and blacklisting applications. So normally the end users would like the ability to assess productivity tools. So you can easily contact unauthorized productivity tools vendors and install and publish their software in your devices. So you can ensure that all of your employees are using the same softwares just in the same way that most of the companies are using Microsoft Office tools such as Word or Excel. In addition to the idea of having whitelisting and blacklisting software applications which can basically control the softwares installed in your user devices, the software should also be reviewed, tested and approved before deployment to the external repository. Or in the worst case, it should be reviewed just before installation. Ideally, each package deployed that is currently supported by the vendor should be tagged as unsupported until approved and reviewed. The unsupported software should find its way to the depreciation list of softwares and after some point of time, it should be removed so it doesn't fail the rest of the applications that your employees are using. Of course, you should always build software inventories by meeting also other security requirements. There is something called EDR, which is the endpoint detection and response. So this means that you should always have visibility to the installed software across all systems. You can run vulnerability management and to scan platforms, which are basically the key things which will provide you some visibility of the software installed in each system that you scan. Those systems can be combined and used by themselves to start gathering and deploying or installing software into the environment of all devices. So an ideal solution would be to have a simple inventory with physical and virtual devices. You should record each software component installed in each device using the corresponding name, vendor number, uh, installation date and the support status. So this is how guys you are managing the software on your devices. I hope this video was useful for you. Thanks for watching and in the next video we are going to code a discussion for how you can prioritize the different software and hardware devices in your company. Prioritizing devices, software and apps. Hi everyone and welcome back to the course. In today's video we are going to talk about the risk planning component. And the risk planning component is responsible for developing criteria and assessing priority ratings for each local control system in risk. 
So the different resources should be prioritized based on their classification, criticality, or business value. But let's talk about prioritization. So by prioritizing, we mean establishing local access control used to design security level. This security level is tied to a set and it should determine which people can use that asset. So you can work with any classification system to determine the priority level that the best suits to your organization. It doesn't need to be complicated or tricky, but you should make sure that it's really specific enough to determine the priority levels and achieve a good ranking of importance. It could be a really simple one. For example, you could have internal, external, and highly sensitive content. And you should make sure that you always assign only one asset from the tasks that you are doing and every asset should be assigned only to one category but not to many of them so you avoid confusion. You can even create this process as conversational so your organization can really understand and draw what is viral for its business. And having classification framework can really engage people to explain what's essential for their work. So the process for engaging people with that is actually essential to help developing this uh, prioritization scheme. And I would say the most critical thing here is to decide which asset has the most business value. Here many components can come into play when determining the ranking of the different assets. But in this slide I'm going to present you some factors that you can really take into account when developing those priority ratings. So the first thing, you should ask yourself what role the asset plays in generating revenue. Then you should decide the degree of how integral the asset is to the current operation, how frequently bad actors target that asset, how expensive the asset would be if it fails and you need to repla replace it, or even how expensive the asset is to protect. Some assets might not be very expensive, but the value and the cost for protecting them could be quite high. And finally, you should really determine the reputational or the legal damage that would ensure that the asset was captured, or how is that asset protected by the law. Those factors that you can see in front of you are basically suggestions. You need to develop your priority list based on your, on your unique circumstances. And you should also make sure that you document how you are creating those priorities. The critical point here is that you develop a standard criteria to identify the criticality of all assets. So when you're prioritizing assets, one thing you need to keep in mind is maintaining the inventory and all sensitive information that is stored processed or terminated by your organization technology system. And this should include the sets located on site and the ones that are using remote service providers. So this is how guys you can prioritize your devices. I hope this video was helpful for you. Thanks for watching. And in the next video, we're going to look at the security requirements for your employees. Thanks for watching. Personal security requirements. Hi everyone. In today's video, we're going to talk about the security requirements for your personnel and the third-party stakeholders. In the NIST framework, this is denoted in the IDAM6 called Cybersecurity Roles and Responsibilities for the entire workforce and third-party stakeholders. So before getting into this activity, it is very advisable to create a security awareness program for all workforce members to complete regularly to ensure that they understand and possess the necessary behavior and skills to ensure that the organization is safe and secure. You should develop your own organization security awareness program so that you make sure that you engage all of your workforce. Establishing personal security requirements means that you decide which personnel at all levels, executives, management, staff, and third-party stakeholder have access to what asset or to what level of security clearance. The importance of knowing who has access to various assets within the organization or outside your organization will only increase the number of devices used and platforms over which the contents get delivered. So without user-defined roles or responsibilities, the ability to make security access could be really affected by the times of system branches and malfunctions. So to solve that, let's talk about some essential tasks that you need to undertake when you are defining the workforce and the third-party roles. The very first thing, and this is one of the most important, is requiring the third-party providers 
to comply with the personal security politics that are already established by your organization. You also need to make sure that you're documenting the personal security requir requirements so you can really keep track on them and have some standard that you can follow. Then you need to define the minimum acceptance standards of your information security requirements and you should make sure that include those in all contracts. So basically a person cannot start in your company, this person doesn't meet those requirements or if a person started already in your company that he need to make sure that all of those requirements are fulfilled within a certain period of time. And finally, of course, since you are interested in making sure that all that is followed, you should establish the right to audit some portion of the contracts of the third-party employers. Although establishing security requirements for organization personnel is relatively routine, establishing those requirements for uh, third-party providers can be a little bit challenging for some organizations. So, third-party providers are sometimes quite hard to identify or even more, they could be difficult to track and make sure that they meet all the security requirements. So, of course, your contractors don't need to be only the IT support personnel, but they can also be software developers, website designers, vendors or system support consultants, or any other third party that regularly require access to your organization network and resources. So, you should include in all of those agreements, all of those contractor agreements, the organization personal requirements and the security levels that are necessary for each person to work for the company. All third-party employees should also be required to provide your organization with time notification of any personal changes on a daily basis. The same procedures for informing employees, executives and any other inter internal organizational staff of their security rights and responsibilities should also apply to third parties. So, this concept should make sure that the same rules are applied to both internal and external parties because this would help to track more efficiently and make the necessary adjustments to various levels of the system security over time. One critical step of establishing personal security requirements is to gain buy-in from the organization top. This should always be set by executive or someone from the leadership team of the organization. They should set up the tone that the cybersecurity is part of the organization through its training, development, implementation and culture. Beyond setting the tone, someone must be assigned to lead cybersecurity program, assess all the organizational risks and map a plan to reduce a risk. This should be basically a personnel that is specifically assigned to the cybersecurity problems in your organization. So whether your organization is small or large, you should designate personnel by name and role and assign them cybersecurity responsibilities. This designation will help immediately later on when you need to establish vulnerability management and the incident response capabilities of your company. If you have vulnerable vendors or critical providers to your services, you should really integrate them in your cybersecurity program. This integration holds even if you outsource your security to a managed security service provider, MSSP, or simply a security organization center, which is called SOC. So this is how you can deal with third parties and really make sure that you assign all of those to your internal policies and they have the right security clearance. That's it, guys. Thank you very much for that video. In the next video, we're going to talk about governance. Governance. Hi, guys. In this video, we're going to talk about governance. The cybersecurity risk planning and management has a set called governance. And this aspect covers the politics, procedures, and the processes to manage and monitor your organization regulatory, legal risk, environmental, and operational requirements. This is basically a way of defining a set of actions to protect against the threats and vulnerabilities in your organization, making sure that you establish formal management policies, and making sure that you're really carrying those policies into day-to-day -day basis. One of the most critical aspects of governance of the IT, cybersecurity and other technical professionals is to know that you need to educate the top management about the cybersecurity risks so they can basically factor those risks to decision making. A cybersecurity risk escalates, boards, directors and executives are increasingly held responsible for managing the cybersecurity threats by stakeholders and other personnel. In some industries, regulators are watching which puts even more pressure 
on the top executives to stay informed and possibly do some actions in that area. So you really need to make sure that you know your laws and regulators. So this is the most important thing because if you don't know them, you don't need you don't know basically what you need to comply with. So that is really the baseline of what you need to know to understand and make sure that all of the governance and policy structures really covers your organization and ensures that it follows the law and the regulations. It is really different by the industry, by the size of your company and the physical operations that you are performing. You also need to rely on your parties within the company. As you may not have all the answers so you need to find a way to find them so regardless your organization size developing a system for informing top decision makers of cybersecurity risks is playing a very important role of any job your plan does not need to be too formal and the top level decision makers don't really need to become experts on the technical matter they do however need to understand the competitive implications of the cybersecurity risk. So once you worked out on informing the top management, the board of directors or any relevant organization committees, it is important to schedule regular updates for those committees. So suppose that your organization is scheduled in a way that those top level updates can't easily take place. In that case, it might be really reasonable to create cyber risk advisory council that can then provide reports, updates to the board of the executive management. Ideally, an executive level steering committee that is composed of that is composed of business, regional and functional leaders could be accountable to the board of directors for the cybersecurity program's success. So it is important to say that the steering committee would be responsible for providing the program leader with all the risk management decisions. Overall, the goal of this committee should be to get the cybersecurity viewed as an operational risk, not just an IT risk. So many mid-sized organizations tend to outsource the management of the cybersecurity to different departments. If that's your situation, and let's say you want to outsource to cybersecurity vendor, the good cybersecurity governance still requires you to develop a framework that keeps managing the cybersecurity through that external vendor. That said, thank you very much for watching, guys. And in the next video, we're going to talk about the risk assignment and management. Risk assessment and management. A risk assignment is simply putting a forth to identify threats in your organization. How likely there is that something bad happens and what is going to be the consequence from that danger. So it would be really happy if you would use risk assessment to really support your organization strategy because that would give you the information you need to deploy specific practices and controls to address the risk that you identify. They will also help you to assess how effective your procedures and rules for managing that risk are. So risk assessment typically includes risk management, but the best approach is to implement the risk assessment framework which will really help you to develop objective measurements of risk and better protect your assets that are in risk. It would really help if you used the risk assessment framework as a helpful guide to determine what is assessed, who needs to be involved, and the criteria for developing relative degrees of risk. In short, there are tools for making sense of what can be actually a very complex idea to implement. Among some of the frameworks in use by other industries, you can find the, the operationally critical threat asset and vulnerability evaluation, which is called OCTAVE and is built from the Carnegie Mellon University. Then you have the guide for conducting risk assessment and the risk IT guide. You can definitely search those names in Google if you're more interested and have some additional information about what those guys do and how you can implement them into your organization. And really, one of the key aspects here is to identify where your organization has vulnerabilities. And this is the fundamental first step for conducting full risk assessment. This aspect of the cyber risk planning and management is really important for any organization. And even more than this, the Council of the Cybersecurity defines the vulnerability assessment as an effect 
of the effort to continuously acquire assets and take actions on new information to identify uh, vulnerabilities, resize or minimize the window for giving the attackers opportunity to attack your organization. So knowing where you're vulnerable can be achieved by having a complete and updated hardware and software inventories. You cannot identify vulnerabilities on software and assets if you don't know that they exist. You can really leverage automation tools and risk registries to document the risks that are associated with your assets. So employees operating or overseeing the vulnerability management program for organization should be trained on all automated tools and methods to identify new vulnerabilities for your company. They should also be responsible for the proper handling of those vulnerabilities that are disclosed to your organization third parties. So to identify those vulnerabilities, you can follow those two activities. First of all, you can use vulnerability scanning tools in your organizational systems. The next step is keeping abreast of vendor security alert that will be responsible for announcements and periodic attacks or even penetration testing into your organization. It's always a good idea to test your systems for, for vulnerabilities yourself than somebody else that you don't want it there. There is really no one-size-fits-all approach for conducting vulnerabilities assessments because so much depends on your particular technical configuration. It is also important how large your organization is and many, many other factors. So that's it. We're going to end this video here, guys. And in the next one, we're going to talk about how you can identify internal and external threats. Thanks for watching. Identifying internal and external threats. Hi, guys, and welcome back to the course. In this video, we're going to talk on how you can identify internal and external threats. So once you identify your vulnerabilities, a good next step is to identify the threats or the kind of threats that are most common for both internal and external attackers if they approach your organization. In the NIST framework, this is defined in the IDRA3, which is called threats, both internal and external, should be identified and documented. A useful definition distinction between assessing vulnerabilities and identifying threats could be helpful here. Vulnerabilities are those aspects of your systems that attackers can exploit. Threats are the tools that attackers use to exploit your vulnerabilities. It is essentially possible to find vulnerabilities in your system for which no threats or exploits seem to have been developed. The best means of identifying whether your vulnerabilities are targeted for exploitation and how best to deal with those, with those vulnerabilities is to participate in established formal and informal information sharing programs where your peers can share the kind of threats they've been experiencing and how they manage those. Participating in other cybersecurity forums and staying informed about cybersecurity news can also help to assess the threats that you face. Ideally, automated tools or systems should be in place to ensure that both internal and external threats are identified and eventually documented. You can perform some fundamental threat modeling, which is a significant effort that will really enhance the security in your organization. Threat modeling could be as simple as taking an employee and determining the damage that this employee could result to the organization if he wants to perform some adverse actions. An essential step here would be to identify the vulnerable systems that this employee would have access to. You can re really extend this exercise to external threats such as uh, external vendors, commodity malware and other types of lower level attacks. So this is how you can identify threats guys. In the next video we're going to talk how to focus on the highlighted risks for your organization. That's it. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Focus on highlighted risk. Hi guys. In this video, we're going to talk about how you can identify the highest risks and how you can basically focus on them. This aspect of the cybersecurity risk planning and management is denoted in the IDRA5, which is called threats, vulnerabilities, likelihoods and impacts are used to determine risk.
This basically means that once you know where you're vulnerable, the kind of threats that you face, and the likelihood of those threats, you should really focus on the vulnerabilities and the threats with the highest risk. Some vulnerabilities will leave the organization open to more damage than other vulnerabilities, even if the likelihood of the threats is low. Some threats would be of a minor annoyance, while others could shut down operations. So you should decide where the most significant risk is and which risks are focused on the most critical assets for your organization. For example, let's say your chief criteria you use to rank the importance of assets and whether or not those assets are critical to maintaining your e-commerce system reliability. Suppose your organization content server has vulnerabilities but exploits of those vulnerabilities is quite unlikely. In that case, you may still rate that assess as high importance from the risk perspective because any threat to the content server, however low, could re-threaten your e-commerce activity. The other way around is also true. Let's say your organization's public address system has vulnerabilities and the threat of exploiting is very high. Your colleagues who use the same network have been hit with attack that basically assess the public, assess the public address system. Despite this happening, you might rate this assess as lower level importance, despite the greater frequency of possible attacks. And this is because your main goal is to maintain your e-commerce system and your internal public address system won't affect the e-commerce system. So if you can see the figure in front of you, this could really make you make some sense of the risk personalization involved here. As you can see, the level of threats and the value of the assets can intersect all kinds of ways to create high and low risks. It really comes up to how you score your assets and how your assets are likely to be exploited to threats. So some organizations may be willing to accept risk in some circumstances because the cost of addressing those risks might be too high, especially if you compare it with the harm. Those type of risks are defined as the residual risks, but they also should be tracked into the risk assessment process. So for organizations that are short on time and personal, several different methods can determine your risk level for various assess. The most simple way is to simply use Excel spreadsheet to document your vulnerabilities and the likelihood of the potential, potential impact that a known risk could have to your system. So some useful tasks here might be to use vulnerability scanning tools through your organization system or simply keeping security alerts for periodic attacks. So this is how, guys, you can really use this figure to decide on what assets you want to focus to conduct more extensive risk management so your organization can be prepared for the important assets and do not invest time and money into the ones that are not that important for the main operation of your organization. Thanks for watching and in the next video we are going to talk about how to deal with the highest risk. Thanks for watching. Plans for dealing with the highest risk. Hi everyone and welcome back to the course. The final component of this section would deal with the effects that are specified in the NIST framework subcategory risk responses to identify the highest risk. So coming up with plans for dealing with the highest risk means finding out what likely response you have to the highest risk threats and coming up with some strategic options and actions actually to address those risks. Any response plans you have should always be consistent with the goals of your organization. For example, while implementing malware removal, you can't just uh, shut down across to all the e-commerce systems entirely, but instead you might be able to shut down some other non-essential systems, such as invoice processing. But how to deal with the highest risk? NIST lays out the process for dealing with the highest risk and denotes some of the key points that the organization should do. So those key points are that you need to implement a process for ensuring that plans of actions and milestones for the security programs and all associated organizational information systems are developed and maintained properly. They should also be documented. You should always make sure that you document all the information related to the security actions 
because in that way you will be able to accurately and adequately respond to risk. And that risk could threat the organizational sets, individuals or even other organizations that you work with. You should also review the plans of actions and milestones. And this is done for consistency with the organization risk management strategy. And this really helps you to state the organization wide priorities for risk response actions. So let's see what the process for dealing with the highest risk requires. So the process requires that each option or action needs to have an owner. And this owner should be within your organization and should be responsible for th that activity. The manager of the organization can also delegate that authority to a third party or to external company. The choice is completely yours. But most importantly here, this aspect of the risk management should be always viewed from the organization perspective and point of view and highlight the needs specific for your company that you should bring to the stakeholders across the organization when developing the response plan. So those assessments can actually take form of scenario testing where you identify the hypothetical threats and risk and you model them and then try to produce a threat for your company artificially. Such scenario testing or assessments can really give your organization comfort when real world cybersecurity threats arise. So this type of cybersecurity risk planning really shows your efforts that you've undertaken. And this will pay off in increasing the security in your organization and the peace in mind in your coworkers. It would also really help if you integrate the informational risk into your day-to-day -day activities. Like for example, launching a new products or services to adopt this risk assessment by setting up additional significant events. That would really help to train your staff or coworkers and make sure that they test all possible scenarios and they are trained properly. That's it guys, thank you very much for watching. That was the last video in that section. In the next section, we are going to talk about how you deal with risk on a network. Thanks for watching. User and Network Infrastructure Hi guys! As I mentioned, in this section we are going to talk about the series of steps that you can take to improve the organization network infrastructure and we will talk for topics such as uh, improved access control, awareness, training, data security, uh, protection policies, maintenance and so on. But to understand how important the network infrastructure is, let's talk about the Alan's problem. So Alan is a senior IT engineer for the Motors organization and today he is spending a relaxing Thursday night at home playing his favorite video game. His company, a remote col collaboration tool, pops up on his screen on the right hand corner while he plays his favorite game. So this looks weird and he also thinks that this is quite weird. He has used his remote collaboration tool, which by the way is called Talk Talk. So he used it earlier while working remotely from home. He's been using the tool to discuss the new network integrations in his company. But the meeting ended hours ago. So Alan looks at the Talk Talk tool and there is actually no one there in the meeting room. So he thinks that Maybe he accidentally clicked on the tool's icon. So he basically closed the tool and he resumed his game. So when he showed up in the office the following day, everything was in chaos. The company manufacturing system has been hacked and the attackers are systematically erasing the firmware for some assembly line servers. Everyone is running around trying to figure out what happens and what to do. It takes the company all day to recover from what was one uh, sophisticated and very dangerous attack. Recovering from that attack wasn't easy because one of the first things that the attackers did was to erase specific critical backup files. So the damage that was caused by the unknown attackers might have been even worse if your company doesn't have a quick thinking engineer that could simply cut off the power supplies of the critical servers, which basically kept the damage up to life. So Alan's company hired FBI forces and they spent weeks to figure out what happened. So as they figured it out, you need to have an account with super user privileges to gain access to every system in the company. So the attackers logged in to this type of account to assess and destroy the backup files and erase them from the firmware. However, the investigators checked all the super user accounts and the log files consisting of that information and those didn't show any of the system 
was assessed by any of the employees in the company. So then the investigators actually said to the chief of the information security about the situation. And he suddenly remembered, Alan has been given super user privileges just for a day to test potential new applications and vendor recommendation. So Alan was actually not on the latest list of super users, but this has been weeks ago. So normally the investigators went to Alan and asked him, what's going on but Alan swears that he did not log in into the relevant systems so after a close investigation of the Alan personal computer the investigators figured out that there was installed e-logging software and this actually captured the Alan's credentials on the talk talk tool so in the final report of the investigators Alan's home computer was catched from the attackers and in that way they gained a complete system authorization by getting his credentials so in the end of the day everything was our own fault so that situation basically illustrates that you should always keep a close track of all the user accounts in the organizational network and this can really make the difference between a secure network or cyber security crisis so let's see until the rest of that section what you can do in order to protect your network the first topic i will state in that video is called infrastructure planning so as you can see the infrastructure planning helps you to build safeguards and security controls into your organization network and assets it's all about protection so in that section we are really going to rely heavily on the critical concepts in the NIST framework for improving the critical infrastructure of the cybersecurity in your company which should potentially make a big difference in your company so you know that NIST developed their framework to help organizations of all kinds to straighten their cybersecurity practices and especially in circumstances where the companies are completely new to the cybersecurity to develop and implement those practices in an simple manner so one of the NIST framework most significant significant components is a series of desired secure states that fall under the protect function so let's talk about the protect function there are a few components that are related to this function so the protect function supports the ability to reduce the attack surface or simply limit the impact after your cybersecurity system in your company resources have been attacked it will also help you to develop and implement safeguards that are really needed to minimize risk to sensitive information critical assets control your assets patch management firewalls backup security awareness and can even help you with training your stuff so according the NIST framework protecting your organization involves six cybersecurity categories assets control awareness and training data security information protection processes and procedures maintenance and protective technology we will of course walk through each one of those activities in uh, this section and i will offer you a specific recommendation on how you can handle all of them so we'll do that by mapping each of those recommendations to its specific corresponding NIST framework subcategory so that you can dig really deep into that resources that are made available via the NIST framework so here I will really give you a general introduction for all of those subcategories and we will even hit very high points of what you actually need to know. We will also explore some recommendations for technical standards for each of those subcategories that you can see in front of you. And one of the key points here is that when you watch the videos from that section, you should always keep in mind that there is not one approach that fits to all types of organizations. And this is because each company is unique. Each organization has its priorities, technical configuration, financial constraints, and operating philosophy. So you should use those aspects in order to build your own cybersecurity practices. So some of the recommendations that I state here might not apply to your organization, but they might be really applicable for your organization in the future once it grows. That's it, guys. Thank you very much for watching that video. And in the next one, we're going to talk about authentication and assess control thanks for watching authentication and assess control hi everyone in this video we're going to talk about authentication and assess control and we'll start by talking about assess control so what assess control is assess control is the most important 
critical step for protecting your organization networks and assets. It is actually the very first step that you need to take in order to establish a good cybersecurity framework in your organization. It is basically a process that ensures that only authorized users gain access to only what they are authorized to assess, nothing else. In other words, the outcome of assessing control is access to assets and associated facilities should be limited to authorized users, processes or devices and those devices and users should only have access to authorized activities and transactions. But before continuing, let's actually try to make the difference between authentication and authorization. Let's first talk about authentication. So authentication is the act or process for determining that a user is who they say they are and also gathering information on how they are assessing the systems. For example, if Jack is working in accounting, he should be able to assess the payroll system of the company network using his login ID and password. However, if he tries to assess the system from home, he has to provide second form of authentication by typing a passcode sent to his phone, for example. On the other hand, authorization is the act of determining the level of assess an authorized user has to system and data in that system. So let's use the Jack example here as well. So if Jack is in accounting, he is authorized to assess payroll systems, but he cannot update software in the network and in the management system because this is not his job responsibility. So he has no reason for gaining access to that system. So to efficiently, efficiently implement the access controls, your organization must first identify which systems are to have controlled access and under what rules that assess should be gained. So determining the systems for which you must control the assess is very strategic, strategically important. Your risk assessment analysis can be very useful for drawing up a list of systems for which assess control should be applied. And also in those guidelines you can draw how you want this to be applied. You can always consider factors when gaining an assess to users. Factors such as connection type, action types such as create, read only, update or delete, time of day that the assess can be gained, applying global permissions or combined privileges. So ultimately the goal of your organization is to employ the practice for least privilege necessary to each employee to perform his job. The least privilege rule means that it is safer and more secure to give users only those privileges they need to complete the tasks that are covered by their rule in the organization. There are many appropriate steps to implement to assess this control adequately. So let's first talk about accessibility and period awareness. So you should always be aware of who has access to which system, for which period of time and from where exactly the access is gained. Organizations often have to manage many different systems and system accounts from the individual, shared, group, guests, anonymous, developers or service accounts. Generally speaking, you should restrict accounts to assess unneeded information. You can restrict those accounts by creating a password time. You can restrict by uh, geography, restricting by source or restricting by certificate. All of those can really be implemented by a variety of tools that are applying the cybersecurity policies. In the leech of the cybersecurity console, the objective of this aspect is to actively manage the life cycle of the system and the application accounts, including their creation, use and deletion. This would really minimize the opportunities for attackers to assess your system. So to establish access control, it is quite essential for your organization to accurately track into your account activity procedures and detect all the different system account characteristics that we mentioned above. And they are also unique to the specific circumstances of your organization. So you should always make sure that you are really consistent with the definition of the authorization and the user assets privileges. In addition to managing the credentials for activating authorization, it is equally important that your organization establish procedures for deactivating authorizations. And this is especially important where there is a set of temporary accounts for short-term or emergency purposes. 
so the activation of those temporary accounts often bypasses the standard procedures and can really get lost if you don't establish a good inventory practices to record all the accounts. That's it guys, thanks for watching that video and in the next one we're going to talk about control list and remote access. Control list and remote access. Hi guys, in this video we're going to talk about the building practices to establish, maintain and audit an active control list that consists of information who can physically assess your systems. This is as part of PR AC2 of the NIST framework guidelines called physical assess to assets is managed and protected. So establishing assess control procedures is not a helpful activity unless your organization establishes procedures that prevent unauthorized assess, damage or interference with your organization systems. Therefore, it is critical to develop a process for verifying who can gain physical access to your system. You can accomplish this by, for example, establishing practices that would state that for gaining access to equipment, the user has to present a card key plus two-factor authentication. Those could be something like PIN number or even a fingerprint. To maintain an adequate access to systems, it is very helpful to create audits of who gained access to which system. You will find very beneficial to keep access control list that contains all of the authorized credentials and the specific individuals to which those credentials apply. So let's talk about establishing policies, procedures and controls for who has control to your systems. This is actually denoted in the PR AC3 which is called remote access should be managed. So managing remote access to systems as we already mentioned is critical part of the cybersecurity because the likelihood of unauthorized access increases when remote access to your systems is involved. And if you don't know what remote access is, this is basically the way to assess organization systems through external network such as internet. Your organization should establish formal remote access procedures, politics and controls for all types of remote communication facilities including virtual private networks and mobile devices. This is done to determine who has access and what type of access you give from your remote locations. We are going to discuss in this course how to establish remote access procedures for vendors and other third parties because it is also very important. However, in terms of access control, the remote access policies apply to organizational employees who use their personally owned devices or other privately owned devices in public facilities to assess the organization systems. Many organizations handle this problem and you should also consider that by using virtual private networks or VPNs. The VPN can really protect your network and also there are new evolving solutions that replace some of the VPN servers using software defined networks which focuses on controlling access at application layer rather than network layer. But this is topic for another course. A software defined network can really cut down the complexity of designing and maintaining access control list. There are also other methods which you can use to protect the organization from threats that are coming from remote access. Some of those are doing mandatory health checks of an employee equipment or other privately owned equipment. You can also apply policy based access control that assesses the device, the network that the user use to connect from and the resources that are attempted to be assessed. You can also use isolation techniques to limit the remote access only to the sections of network that the employee needs based on the business needs. So for that you can use for example jump servers or software defined networks. So that was all about how you can maintain your remote access. Thanks for watching and in the next video we are going to talk about network security controls. If you want to check out the complete 10-hour NIST cybersecurity course that involves the detect, recover, respond and the rest of the NIST cybersecurity network functions, you can definitely check the link in the description. I helped more than 200,000 students to already achieve their IT career goals and I have plenty of free content here in this channel, so please subscribe 
or check the rest of my courses from the description. Network security controls. Hi everyone, in this video we are going to talk about the access permissions and the least privileged theory when applied on cybersecurity networks. You could find that into the PRAC4 from the NIST cybersecurity framework called Access Permissions are managed incorporating the principles of least privilege and separation duties. So the least privilege principle states that the users should only have access to the information and the resources that they need to do their job. So the idea is to break down tasks so there is no single person in control of all the information. An excellent example of the value for this separation of responsibilities could be something that we actually saw recently and this was a super phishing scam that were happening into the business corporate emails. So those scams were sent by people that were representing themselves as CEOs or CFOs that are requesting wire transfers to their accounts. And this scam actually targeted mainly financial departments. So the way this issue was overcome is when the companies were assigning the ability to do wire transfers only to a single person in their corporation or in the department. Also, you, get, you can add a chain of approvals in order a wire transfer to be completed, which means that, first of all, you need to train less people on those phishing scams, and also you need multiple people to approve certain action before this action is completed. So they can really be some exchange of opinions and in that way the scam can be easily captured. So you should always make sure that only the users that really need sensitive information have access to that, not users that actually don't need it. And also even for the users that have access to that information, you should add the correct way of security checks so you can make sure that this information cannot be exposed and cannot be stolen by attacker. Another common technique that attackers used is a process of eliminating all possible options for the user password. So usually the hackers can use a list of very common passwords used by users and pretty much guess them. So your organization should definitely eliminate that. So since most of the accounts with access to sensitive information have higher likelihood for attackers to try to assess them, the screening process for your organization and the control over this account should be greater. So to assess the password issues, you can definitely take action about this and improve your organization's security. The first thing that you could do is to develop built-in operating system that contains lists of accounts, so you know all the accounts that have higher privileges in your organization. Another very good technique is to ban users with super privileges from surfing into the web or even reading emails from those accounts. This would really limit the hackers and they will have no information about, about those super accounts. You should also consider employing privileged access management, management system. In that way, the users will never know the password until you check them out. So after the user completes their work, you can change the password automatically and next time you can provide this password again to the user. There are also plenty of built-in softwares that you can use to create stronger passwords and stronger password protection. So you can create systems that do not accept passwords which are consisting just of numbers, but you could also request the user to add letters, other type of characters, caps, and so on. You can also check for word sequences that are very commonly guessable by the hackers and you can eliminate them from the password. I really recommend you to also use additional authentication factors especially for privileged administrative accounts or especially where there are accounts that are externally hosted or applications that you create from internet that you want your employees to assess remotely. Most of the browsers our days also have built-in browser password checks. So for example, if your organization is using Chrome or Firefox, you can definitely do that. You can add options to enforce password resets and you can do that for all the accounts that come up as important after you perform those checks. You should always implement network security controls to all internal communications, to all the accounts where that's necessary. And this is actually denoted in the PRAC5 of the NIST cybersecurity framework called Network Integrity and Protection. So the Network Integrity Protection mainly deals with the network security management. This entails monitoring and implementing security controls. And this is done on internal networks and also when communicating with external networks as well. 
And here we should talk about something called network segregation. The network segregation is a logical grouping of network assets, resources, and different applications. The grouping of all of those is done to pull them together into areas or segments that don't trust one another. So the benefit of that segmenting, or we can say with simple words grouping assets, are greater visibility to your network traffic, protecting all the communications, especially when they flow into and out of your organization. And finally, setting default deny policies to all of the segments into your communication. And as an example here, I can give you that the employees' private mobile communications always rely on the organizational Wi-Fi. So since the Wi-Fi connectivity basically provides you the access to all the systems, this means that you can basically control the Wi-Fi to control the access to the data of the affected systems. So without the segmentation, the administrators would not be able to determine how much traffic over the organization internet are due to employee mobile devices. And this is something that provides security risks. And so once the organization has this information, it can definitely implement some additional policies for how these mobile devices can be assessed and if they are going to be provided with access to the core system functions. Now let's talk about the firewall. The firewalls is one of the critical components of protecting the network integrity. So firewalls are used specifically to segment parts of your computer systems. They're also used on networks as well. They're used to block unauthorized access, but at the same time, permit communications from the reliable systems or networks. So instead of restricting unauthorized users, firewalls restrict unauthorized communications. There are many types of firewalls and many different vendor products. So the details on how you can implement the firewalls could really vary considerably. So regardless of what technology you might use or which vendor you select, there are actually some very useful principles to consider when implementing firewalls into your organization. So let's talk about those. The first principle is to always make sure that, you're, that you create policy that is consistent with your organization risk management philosophy. And when I say philosophy, this means what requirements you have to your firewall to handle inbound and outbound traffic. After that, you should make sure that you are identifying all the requirements that you should consider when determining which firewall you want to implement. You should definitely consider the sets of resources that your employees have in your organization and where the critical assets of your organization. So you could ask yourself questions such as how many employees from your company are working from home or how many of them are basically working from their mobile devices. Do you want your company to be highly adopted on a cloud and so on. So it would be really helpful if you consider those types of questions before the answers of those questions can really affect your privacy. So if your employees are rarely on site and the company uses quite a lot of cloud solutions, if you create, for example, on-premises firewall, that might actually not be a good fit. Once, once you build all the requirements, now it's time to create a set of rules that implement the organization fire, firewall policy. You need to make sure that you're doing that while supporting the firewall performance. So the rules that you create are pretty much dependent on the type of the firewall that you choose to use, the vendor and all the products related to the firewall. And finally, once you put your firewall into operation, you need to make sure that you maintain it. So you need to manage the firewall architectures, policies, software, and all the components that are related to the firewall lifecycle. If those policies change or your organization grows in some way that you need to change your firewall, you should also consider that. Make sure that you have employees that always examine the firewall logs and the logs of all the alerts related to that. And in that way, you're really going to close the cycle of building a perfect firewall for your team or organization. That was everything for this video, guys. Bear with me in the next one because it's going to be a very important where we're going to talk about authentication and association. Thanks for watching.